Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Nina, and I'm uh, the VP of People and Culture at Dixa. So I head up both People and Culture and TA there. I joined Dixa when we were 30 people. Now we're 230 people. So I've seen both a, a series. Um, B and C, I've been there through COVID and COVID lockdown and, and how that affected the company. And I've also um, been there uh, when we expanded globally and started having more people globally. Um, and finally, I also had my second child while doing all of this. So it's been some crazy two and a half, three years uh, at Dixa. Um, I have a background in philosophy and HRM, and that might seem to you like a weird combination, but philosophy is really just uh, about how you uh, perceive the world and what does that does to the way you manage and deal with people. So it's actually very relevant for, for HR. I finished university just when the financial crisis was as it, at its, high, its highest. And that mean, meant that I couldn't get a job because a newly educated HR person couldn't get a job at that time. So then I ended up uh, taking a, a, ma a manager job in a retail chain called Emery's. They didn't want me to build the HR before I had proven myself in the shops. And that turned out to be a really valuable experience for me because it showed me what does it really take to manage people also in an industry where a resource for developing people and ensuring a good culture is very scarce. There is no resource for that in retail. So I had to make people show up for staff meetings without even ha getting to pay them. So that was really good uh, background for me when I then finally got to build HR and work more in HR. All of my HR jobs afterwards has then been about building uh, HR from scratch. So I'm a builder and not a maintainer. And that is also why I love working in, uh, in, in the tech startup scale-up scene. Um, I wanted to, when I, when, I was, when I prepared this presentation, I thought about where, where do I start this? Uh, and I think um, what um, always happens when you're a founder, you get a good idea, and then you start building a product, and you get the product to a point where you can actually start selling it. So first you focus on product, and then you start focusing on, pr on profit. Can you sell it? Can you get investment to develop it further? But that is also when you um, come across something I call the startup uh, paradox. And the startup paradox is when you have your sales team or your commercial side of the business coming to you and saying, I need money to, uh, or we need to invest in building this for our product because this is what the customers want. Then you go to your product and engineering side of the business and they say, no, we can't build that. We need to build something that is, uh, we need to build this something else because this is what our customers don't know they want tomorrow. So it's this paradox between building for the future versus funding the journey to get there. Also, your invest, if you get investors in, they'll also have an opinion on what you need to focus on. So it's that paradox that you very quickly will be facing as a founder or an early leader in a, in a startup. And the way to handle this, the only way to actually handle this is through a culture that embraces this paradox because you will never be in a situation where you can do both and because resource will be scarce. You will have, uh, either you won't have enough money, you won't have enough people because it takes time to hire, or you won't have, um, um, or you won't have enough time. Um, so, so, so people and culture is really the key for you to move from that very early stage um, and dealing with the, the kind of the troublesome road to success. So today I'm going to hopefully show you how you can make culture a competitive advantage in, in scaling your business. But before we talk more, more about how to do this, I wanted to show you this because um, a lot of founders uh, reaches out to me and then they ask and, and they're like, can we have coffee because I want to, I want to start doing some, something about people and culture. I'm facing these things that it's really difficult to handle and it's not, I don't know what to do with it. And I think um, what is very normal, and this happens earlier than, than what you would expect, 
is uh, a lack of focus and unclear priorities. And that happens as soon as everyone isn't able to be in all of the meetings. So it's already when you're seven people, basically. You don't have to have a big setup around culture at that time, but you need to start focusing on it. Because otherwise, what will happen is siloing. So you'll have people in one side of the business working on their thing, thinking that this will change the things for us, so we have to focus on this. And you'll have people on the other side of the business focusing on their things, and they will start arguing what's more important. Um, so already, when, you can, when everyone isn't in the same meetings, you have to, to start working with this. Then the next uh, thing that they, that they come to me and want to talk about is um, kind of the consequences of single loop learning and, uh, and short-term solution. In, in the beginning, it's, it's very busy. You want to do many things and you want to do it quickly. So what then happens is um, you start kind of not thinking about things. You, you stop, you don't ask the why. You just uh, change the how you do things. So you want to target a certain segment in the market and you do a plan and you ask them to do this and somebody else to do this and you do it and you fail. Then you go back and then you think, okay, this didn't work. Let's change how we did it. We ask marketing to do something different or we ask our salespeople to behave in a different way. And you target the same segment. But what you really need to do at that point is question, do, I, do we even want to target the segment? Why are we targeting this segment? Because otherwise you can end up using a lot of time on things that will, uh, be, uh, won't work or only will work temporarily. All of this kind of leads to um, uncertainty about performance in the company if you don't work with it from the early beginning. So you can't really give your, your, your employees uh, proper feedback on their performance and that'll then affect their engagement and they'll leave. Um, and I think just the point with this is that this happens very early. Okay, so culture and what it is. Uh, when I first started at Dixa, we, um, we, we did a culture and values workshop, and I was like, what, what is the difference in culture and value? What does it mean we just use it for the same thing? Or, so we looked into it and kind of how I see culture, I see it like your values and, and uh, beliefs in action. So if, you, if you, you can think about beliefs and values as the bedrock of your kind of your your, your culture, and then the culture is those things in action. It's the landscape. And the landscape will change, but you can still have the same beliefs and values when you're 30 people and when you're 230 people. But the culture will be different because now there's 230 people. So it can't be a culture of we all meet and look each other in the eyes. It will be a culture of uh, interacting in a different way. That's just an example. So my beliefs and value as a leader would be that I really trust in people. I think that people will, if uh, they'll always try to be responsible and uh, be um, um, and kind of try to do their best. So uh, my values as a leader are kind of the, the right thing to me for me to do as a leader is to uh, enable us uh, create a situation where they can do that. I don't I don't have to control them or follow up so much. Um, the culture will then be kind of a culture of trust. Again, the culture, even me having these beliefs and values will ha look different when we were 30 to now we're 230, right? We will, for instance, have to have OKRs to just understand what everyone is doing. It's not about control. I still believe sincerely that people, you know, want to do their best, but we still have to have this setting around it on, on how we kind of follow up on what people are doing. Uh, so, as a founder, you have uh, an influence on your culture top-down. You both have an, a direct uh, um, influence, and that's just how you behave. Do you interrupt? Do you listen? Do you have people that you favorize in the organization? Are you biased? Uh, do you focus on data, or do you focus on hearsay? So, that was, will directly impact your culture. It won't define the whole culture in the company, but it'll have a heavy effect on your culture. So it is very important as a, for a founder to be aware of their own beliefs and values and how that kind of comes into action when they walk around in their company. The next part that are also a kind of a top-down uh, 
effect on culture is um, it's, it's, it's the indirect um, factors. And the indirect factors are the structures and the systems you set up to enhance your culture. Because again, when you scale, when you're seven people, people will just feel you because they'll be near you all the time. When you're 230 people, they won't feel you anymore. So you have to have some structures around it to enhance the good part of the culture and what you wanna, the message you wanna get out there. And uh, my point here would be, delegate this early because I see a lot of founders and CFO, uh, CEOs and CFOs, they try to do this themselves for a long time, but it takes such a long time that then they don't focus on developing the business. So it's, it's a good idea to have people in early to take this off your, off your hands. Then uh, I want to talk about the bottom-up um, influences on, on culture. And um, we all know, you know, when you walk around in a company and you see these kind of generic value posters on the walls, nobody knows what it stands for. They for sure don't live them. They're like, what, what is this? Um, and that is because that uh, you as a leader and a founder, you cannot like, decide the culture. And you can't decide the culture because you have to think about your company and the sub departments and the sub um, teams as systems and systems is a tricky thing to deal with because systems you can't force anything into a system it's closed um, it's but it's cognitively open so that means you can't as a founder come and say you know I want people to be more accountable go do it like that won't work they'll just be like yeah whatever and go back and do their thing but you can work with your teams and kind of these subsystems to make them understand why we need to be more accountable. And so it's coaching, teaching, it's also expanding the system. And expanding the system is really just hiring new people into the system. And it's also decreasing the system. So when people leave or you split teams up and kind of organize it differently according to, to the need you might have. Okay, so 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 you now know that you can affect your culture bottom-up. Um, my next point would be that don't start working with anything that you don't have data on. Don't do anything people and culture related that you don't haven't kind of had confirmed through data. Because then people and culture will be at most kind of just maintaining some stuff. It won't, it won't add any value and it'll probably also you'll be focusing on the wrong things because to my experience anyway, people, there's a lot of people coming to me and they are really loud about what they need from people and culture and from their leaders, but they're not the majority. The majority won't come to me, but they will respond to surveys and tell me kind of what they need when I ask them anonymously. So that is super important. People won't tell you what they really mean if you don't ask them anonymously. Okay, so how do we work with affecting culture bottom-up at Dixa? We, we gather data in more than three ways, but I'm going to talk about three ways today. We gather data on when people first join. So when we add cognitive um, kind of uh, space to the system, we, we, add, we, we look at what do these people value. So what kind of uh, culture will they need and what kind of culture will they enhance when they, when they join. And some just interesting example could be, be that um, when we start, uh, first started looking at this data set, we could see that we had a lot of people, they did not care about structure at all. Like structure, not for me, which, is, which makes sense. You join a startup because you don't want the whole corporate big kind of system thing. Um, and that's fine to a certain extent because in the beginning you'll, you'll be needing people who like and value and kind of have a culture of we'll figure it out. If we don't know how to, we'll figure it out. But then when you grow, at one point you will have to have people in who likes working at structure because you need more structure as you scale to some extent, right? So that's one thing that we became smarter about when hiring, kind of really looking into, you know, what's, people, what's people's preference on, on structure. And in that way we can influence cognitively, proactively the team so we can actually affect the culture proactively from, from kind of the before the even join, if that makes sense. Um, Another kind of interesting thing was that I, I saw when they wrote up, up a few notes about um, my talk here, they were talking about ping pong tables and Friday bar being culture. And uh, uh, the data set here showed us that uh, the people we had hired, um, they didn't care about so much about the, the relationship side of it. So kind of the Friday bar, hanging out 
outside work. And I mean, this is a bit uh, later stage that was, we started measuring this when we were around 100 people. And, and that's because at that time people had gotten uh, kids, they needed to leave after work. They, need, they wanted to do their work, so what they valued, really valued, was good collaboration. Um, and then what we did was we went back and kind of adjusted what we were going to offer as a workplace. Like, we're going to perhaps focus less on social events and more on really like good collaboration, people feeling that they get a lot of stuff out of the teamwork that they do. And it's not that you shouldn't do like 100, you should not only do 100% of something. Of course, you do a little bit of both, but it gives good direction that you can act on proactively with your culture. What you also want to do, and I don't really understand companies that don't do that because it really takes the temperature on the organization, is measure engagement. So are you walking the talk on your culture? If you don't have an engagement survey, you won't know. You'll have a feeling, but it's, you don't like, it can be a right or wrong. It don't bring any value. So measure your engagement. There's lots of surveys to measure engagement. You can filter and segment and everything in your organization to really understand where are we really walking the talk? Where, where do we have a good culture that gives us what we want as a company? And you can act like also very quickly. And I've seen, I've worked with um, engagement service for a long time, obviously, and I've just seen when engagement is low in a team, people will start leaving. If it's low over a long time, people will leave that team. So it's very clearly an indi indicator of, um, of, uh, of your happiness and if people are like, will leave or not. The final thing I want to talk about is um, the uh, kind of the, the individual part of uh, creating a good culture. We work with a, a talent test that shows us, not a personality test, but rather a talent test that shows us what people like to do. Because if you do what you like to do, you'll stay and you'll be more, you'll have more energy, you'll be more effective, you'll, you'll just um, have a better work life and it'll be better for the company. It'll affect the company positively because you have happy employees and they talk about this company is so great, I get to do what I love to do. So we always wanna aim to match people's preferences with the job they actually do. Um, which of course takes a lot of focus on time, but it's worth it. Um, definitely in terms of uh, retaining people and, um, and also how people go out and talk about the company um, to other, to other uh, future talent we want to hire. Um, the, the next thing is also about that kind of more individual um, kind of preference that is important. When you start the company, you have employees who are, uh, they, they, they love doing a lot of things. They love the thing where, you know, they have this hat on and this, then they have this hat, hat on. Then you scale and people get more specialized because they have to, you, you have to have uh, people focusing on a, a kind of a, a slimmer um, kind of area. And, uh, and, and there's two things there. One, you need to hire people who actually appreciate that. Um, and why I'm saying it like this is that um, I think people who join founders and leaders early on, these kind of companies, they, they sometimes hire people like themselves, so these kind of entrepreneurial people. But at one point, you need to look at people who are maintainers, who are specialist kind of uh, mindset. Um, and what it also does to the people in the company is that they feel that something is taking away from them. When you scale and you add more people in, to do some of the stuff that they had, had the had they, they have had that had before. They feel something is taking away from that. So at that point, that's really an opportunity to re-engagement, re-look at their role, and kind of re-onboard them into the match between what they love to do and what they're actually doing. And that is definitely possible if you scale, because then there's always going to be more great stuff to do. But again, it takes focus and time. Team leads, you want to go to from these kind of uh, people who love kind of more friendly relationship with their team and really cares about, uh, but still kind of are specialists, but they just also take care of the team because they love people. And to a more kind of, um, to team leads who are more uh, like, care, like are more like into the whole people management thing, who really loves doing that rather than perhaps being the subject matter expert. Uh, very important also because the team leads is your extension uh, also. Uh, the culture you wanna um, you wanna implement, people the the team leads are gonna be kind of the 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 booster for that. So you want people who are really aware of that and able to to do that. 
And then the senior leadership team, obviously, also that role changes. You start with being a kind of entrepreneurial, do everything, I know everything in this company, and then you have to step back, uh, be less operational, be more strategic, look further ahead, and it's sure that your company asks and your team asks, why are we doing what we're doing? Does it make sense in terms of where we want to go? And then what you need to do is, of course, so this is a big thing. So what you need to have, you ha need to have the right uh, support set up for, for working with your culture. And uh, when people ask me what we do in, in HR or people and culture, uh, I tell them we do this. So obviously, there's a job for me in aligning our people and culture efforts with the business strategy. Everything I do needs to kind of add values, value to, 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 uh, to the journey to where we want to go as a company. But the other thing that I think people don't think so much about is really the capacity for change. You really want to have, and that's the kind of dealing with the with the, um, the startup paradox that I started talking about, uh, like making sure that your team can embrace that kind of constant change. The admin side, obviously, when we speak about culture, is about delivering the data. You need to understand that the people and culture efforts you do, that um, that, that, brings, uh, that, that actually is, um, makes sense uh, in relation to what people actually feel. And then the last part, the employee contribution, so the engagement. This is where you affect the culture bottom up, cognitively by developing and training and kind of um, putting a lot of um, uh, things from, from, from bottom up into your teams. And, and what do you need to do that? And I know when I, <laughs> when I talk to founders and I say, this is what you need to do this, they tell me like, okay, but I want to hire more developers. And then I like, yeah, so what do you want to do? Do you want to set something in place that will make you success long, succeed long term? Or do you want to more developers in who can build a feature for you right now? So it's again like the, it's the, it's the startup uh, kind of uh, um, um, paradox, right? Uh, and I face that too in my role when I want to build my, my, de my department out. But basically what I've learned is that um, you want to have people partnering, you want people partners, HR, BPs, that's what we call them formally, uh, who are there and close to the teams and kind of develops and, and makes sure that we have a, a healthy, good culture and develops as, as we need to do. Then you want the operations and process management team to ensure the data and all the structures. And that especially gets important when you scale um, when you're not only located in one company anymore because it, gets, it starts to get really painful if you don't have control over your kind of basic HR processes. Um, there's also a risk to it, of course. Then what I've realized is the L&D part is important and it's about uh, creating that capacity for change. You need someone in who focuses on developing your team, your team leaders, but also develop, who can develop and talk about the difficult things being in a startup with the employees. So that's important too. TA, you always want to split it out from PNC. You never want people who do both people partnering and TA because then you're, you won't be effective on your TA side. And if you need to hire quickly, you want a very focused TA uh, department who only does that. But then the executive coaching is important in my eyes because founders who found a company and you know take it to four or five hundred people or whatever, you know that role is so different and it is so difficult. It is so tricky to, to, to go through that journey for the for this for the senior leaders and the founders and they need to they need of course support in that and they probably need someone from outside to give them input on it so somebody who can see it with fresh eyes. And the final thing is the internal comms and employer branding kind of role where it's, it's, that's really also just a booster for all the good stuff you're doing, all the resources you're putting into people and culture. If you don't have somebody who makes sure that we communicate it right to the organization when we, when we hit a certain size, then, um, then we'll have uh, troubles with, the, with, the, with getting the credit for, for all the great stuff we're doing. Um, and then just a checklist um, for, uh, for how to kind of ensure that your culture uh, is a comp can be a competitive advantage. So um, you need to focus on it from the early beginning. And it's already when you're like as many people so that you can't be in the same meetings all the time. Uh, and then you want to understand your own beliefs as a, and values as a senior leader and as a founder because that does affect the company and it's really hard to fake it. 
if you just if you're a person and that's a normal thing that, that you just don't trust people like you think they will perhaps take con like take advantage of freedom or like you're more of a controlling kind of person if that's how you are it's better to just realize it and then start working on it you can also change cognitively but it's better to not try to fake these things as a founder because people will see through it and it'll create a lot of mess in your organization so rather just be honest about what you really what your beliefs really are and your values then you want to retrieve data and you want to like do that from now on until forever and you want to act only on data on your people and culture initiatives then you want to uh, um, using that uh, you want to affect the culture bottom up but you can only do it cognitively so it's the developing it's the teaching it's the um, hiring in the right mindset and it's also like letting go of people who don't have the right mindset anymore and then uh, ensure, of course, that you have the PNC set up who can support you in doing this because you won't have time for it as a senior leadership team. Um, you, you need somebody who can, who can kind of do this for you and really support you. Um, the final part here is just something I wanted to bring up because we, of course, we hire a lot of people at Dixa. And when we hire people, uh, they tell us things about what they're looking for. And these are some of the things that are really like coming up. And I think what the takeaway from that is that um, people are looking for a job that can um, be a great, not only a great addition to their life, but like a, a, a job that can kind of change their life for the better. And it, it should never be them changing around the job. It's always the other way around, at least for the talent we're looking for. They can, they, they can pick and choose between jobs right now. Um, and so we have to really think about how do we attract them? How do we give them that kind of life situation that they're looking for uh, while working with us? So it's not so much about the job, selling a job anymore. It's about selling a lifestyle more. I'm on time. That's it. Thanks.